The following interview was conducted with Charles J. Stewart, uh, Professor Emeritus of Communication, School of Liberal Arts for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, November 12, 2012 at Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, Professor Emerita of Library Science. Welcome. Good morning, Dr. Thank Stewart. You. And thank you very much. Let's start off. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. I was born in Terre Haute, Indiana and grew up there. Eventually went to Indiana State uh, as an undergrad, but uh, most of my, uh, the Stewart family had been there. My great-grandfather joined the Union Army from Terre Haute, so we had been settled in the Terre Haute for a long time. Okay. Uh, it was, I grew up during the Depression. Uh, my what children... You, what year were you born in? In 1936. Okay, okay. Uh, my children can hardly imagine, but uh, I was in high school before we had central heat, before we had running water. Uh, we had pumps and we had coal burning stoves in the house and, and we were in the middle of Terre Haute. This was not, this was the way you lived. So right. it was a different way and... Uh, Tell us a little about grade school and then you can move on to high school. Was grade I went school? to um, Catholic grade schools. Okay. And it was... Um, eight grades or...? All eight grades. Okay. It was still, um, you have to realize uh, that in those days, the uh, Klan was extremely powerful in Indiana. Uh, when they built uh, my school and church back in the 30s, uh, they, the priests sat at the construction sites at night with shotguns because the Klan would destroy the construction if uh, they didn't have guards there. So it was growing up and going to Catholic schools. Uh, I, I knew the public schools as Protestant schools. So I grew up uh, talking about going to Catholic schools. So my friends who weren't Catholic went to Protestant schools. And it took me a long time what religion to did change you have the nuns there? What, what yes, we had Sisters of Providence from okay. Terre Haute. The, the uh, St. Mary's people. Yes, St. Mary of the Woods, where uh, Mother Theodore is now a saint. Um, all eight years with nuns. And uh, interestingly, we had um, two grades in each classroom. A few years ago, I heard that in California, because of budget problems, they were having two grades in one room, and I thought, well, that's terrible. Then I realized, for eight years, I went to school with first, second in one room, second, uh, third, fourth in another room. Fifth, sixth, All eight another. grades? All eight grades. And uh, the Did nun would, would deal with uh, one side of the room, and they would have us seated on sides of the room. And uh, she would teach uh, one side, and then give us some work to do, and then she would teach the other side. Sometimes what we'd get is that we would be on the second side, and she'd give us an assignment. Then she'd say, okay, turn it in. Well, she forgot the fact she just gave us the assignment. We didn't have that half hour or an hour while she was talking to the other side of the room. So it was, but we didn't We managed, see, that's interesting. We, we did that. It was, right. uh, yeah. was school close enough? Could you walk? Or did yes, you say that, oh, okay. all of us walked. There were, uh, okay. There were no lunch rooms. We lived probably about five blocks away or six, okay. and parents would drive you. And, um, it was amazing. My father uh, worked long hours, but if it rained and at lunchtime we would come out, he would be sitting out front waiting for us to drive us home for lunch and drive us back. And that was one of my early memories was my dad always there to pick us up in bad weather. Right. So. That's nice. You didn't have bus service because people walked no. back and forth. Right? Oh, no, we didn't know anything about right. bus service. Okay. Well, let's move on a little bit about high school. Tell us about that. I had an unusual high school. Um, I had uh, for a long time wanted to be a priest. So I entered the high school program at St. Meinhard Monastery in Southern Indiana, mm. the Benedictine Order and uh, was there two years. I had never been uh, a student. I didn't read and uh, came from a family that uh, did not have high school educations and so education was not really pushed. And when I got to the seminary, we took eight solid subjects and went to school six days a week. And I really found myself struggling. Some of the upperclassmen would tutor me and that sort of thing. And uh, that was a big change. A big change. We had Latin, of course, mm -hmm. and as we were approaching the junior uh, junior in high school, we would start taking German and Greek. And uh, one of the monks came to me late in that second year, uh, getting near, and had a heart-to-heart -heart talk and said, we think it'd really be best. You're struggling. 
We don't think you're going to make it academically. If you go home now as a junior in high school, you'll have a chance for two years to get to a circle of friends and that. Yeah. And that was, uh, it was a very kind and Christian thing to do. You lived, so, did you live there too? So oh, that yes. was what you were living away I was 150 home. miles away from home. Right. That's so another adjustment. It was at 14 years old and uh, being 150 miles away from home was, it was yeah. difficult. So. Oh yeah. Then I came back and went to a public high school for a year. In Terre Haute? Uh, yes, Garfield High School, named after the president, and uh, really had trouble fitting in. Um, I had, I would stand up when the teacher would call on me and everyone would look at me like, what's that? But for eight years in grade school and in the seminary, when you were called on, you stood up. Sure, and right. so uh, that I had struggled, and ironically, because the regimen at St. Minard, the academic regimen, had been so stern. I remember it would not be unusual as a freshman or sophomore in high school for a monk to come in, many had PhDs, and they would hand us a piece of paper. It would be single spaced and it'd say, there are a hundred errors on this page. You have 15 minutes to find them. And they were grammatical errors and punctuation errors, spelling errors. If they had handed that to my friends at Garfield, they would have had a heart attack. Well. I was quickly known as the brain of the class, so I went from struggling academically, and they thought I went home and studied all night. I rarely studied, but we, the two years put me so far ahead of a uh, standard school system at that point. But uh, then uh, they were building at that time Scholte High School in Terre Haute, named after Archbishop Scholte in Indianapolis, a new uh, Catholic high school. Mm -hmm. And I knew, as I thought during that summer, but if I went there, we would all be new. It was awfully hard. A lot of my classmates had known each other in kindergarten. So for me to walk in as a junior, and, um, and I was not outgoing and trying to break into that. So I thought, if I go there, we'll all be brand new. So I uh, started at the high school. As a senior? As a senior. Okay. Um, my parents did not have money for the tuition. Unfortunately, I got a job at A&P Supermarket, so I could afford to pay my own tuition to the high school. And it was a, it, it gave me a chance to get to meet people that would eventually introduce me to my wife. So there was good connections. But it was a fun, usually when you go to a high school, all the traditions have been set forever. But we created the this, this song. We picked out Golden Bears as the name. You know, it was, it was interesting to be there. Only 23 of us in that class. Wonderful. But we started all the traditions for the high school. That's so. very, and it's nice to look back on that. It gives you great memories. It does. Yeah. Was and it, it worked. Was, it, going to be, was it a four-year high school? Yes. Okay. But did and they start with all No, four they four? start with all four grades. Okay. But the senior class was only 23 of us. Okay. And then it dropped. And then by the time you got to freshman, it was... Sure. 100 students or something of that nature. Okay. And uh, so that was, that gave me a good year. Did they have any uh, student activities for you with there too? Or? They did, but I was working uh, 30 or more hours a week at a supermarket. Wow. So I didn't get yeah. to take part in student activities. Right. Um, um, you know, the tuition had to be paid and uh, transportation and my parents could not afford that, so... Did you have any, let me ask you, do you have any siblings, any brothers or sisters? Yes, oh. I had two sisters. Okay. I have an older sister who's three years older than I am, and then I had a younger sister who's 11 years younger. Okay. And, uh, Interesting. So, and my younger sister and I are still very close. It was a big brother, little sister relationship, so... <laughs> we uh, continued, right. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting with her. She is now a nun from St. Mary of the Woods and teaches history at Cathedral High School in Indianapolis. And for the last 10 years, uh, I've gone down a day in May, and I teach all of her classes for a day in some area of history. Mm -hmm. And it's been lots of fun. Yeah, right. Has she been at the school for a while? About 25 years now. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Now, how did you then came college? What came next then? Um, I was going to go to the Navy. God knows why. I get seasick, and I can't swim. But Navy sounded like something I was going to do. <laughs> And, um, and it is an interesting story how you think you plan everything. But I was working at a supermarket, and it was about, I remember it very well one night, late in the senior year, and uh, we had unloaded a big truck. That's when they closed the stores at 6, and so we had every aisle full, and I was in charge of, of one large aisle. And of all things I needed, we used to stamp all the prices on with uh, uh, ink stampers, and you'd have a rack of all these numbers. 
And I can remember very well, I was missing a 19 in my rack and charged the aisle, and I had to open all the boxes and put all prices on before the people would stock the shelves. And so I walked through the aisles to uh, get a marker, and a good friend of mine uh, was working in, in charge of that aisle, and I remember looking at it, his name was Fred Johnson, and I said, are you going to go to college? And he said, sure, I'm going to college. I remember going back, stamping all those cans, thinking, he was awfully sure of that. So that summer, I decided I would go to college. And didn't know what I was going to do for sure. Or were you, how about where you were going to go? Well, oh. it was pretty well determined Indiana State because oh. I could live at home and go very inexpensively and still work in a supermarket yeah. would allow me to pay for, uh, again, uh, my parents could not afford to do that. Uh, I was only the second member of the family, my older sister, the first to get a high school education. Um, parents weren't against education, it's just that they, sure. in their day, they each had about two years of high school. Okay. And, uh, and so I went down to Indiana State about a week before classes, walked in the registrar and said, I want to go to college. <laughs> so they dreamed up, I think I had a psych class, an art appreciation, a music appreciation class, you know, whatever was sort of available. I got this, you know, hodgepodge of classes. and Like a chess and checkers, you uh, know. Yeah. I'd always cool. been fascinated by radio. And as a senior, we had gone to Indiana State uh, for a senior day. And I looked through a little window and saw radio studios where the students were actually broadcasting over the air. And so I decided that I would go in non-broadcast and non-teaching uh, broadcasting, and I was going to be a broadcaster. So I showed up at Indiana State, and that's what I was going to do. Didn't happen that way. But that's what you. Uh, that's now, what the then goal you, was. you didn't you didn't live on campus. Well, tell us about oh, no. uh, your course and professors and what campus was like. Campus life. Uh, you continued to work. It while was you very were? different. Oh yes. Uh, now in those days, did you have to pay tuition? Was there fees? Oh yes. Okay. It was very small. Okay. It well, was like compared, eighteen dollars and twenty five cents a were, semester. With fees, right? Not tuition. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just uh, it was a low tuition kind sure. of thing. Uh, there were no fees for like we didn't have co rec gym, uh, sure. nothing. You know, we didn't have tickets to like games and all that sort of thing. So, um, at the campus was it was then Indiana State Teachers College. Okay. Had been Indiana Normal College, which was the typical name, name for, for teachers, teachers colleges. Yeah. And uh, almost everyone I knew was going into teaching. And about 95% of us lived within 30 miles of campus. Um, on Friday afternoon, campus was deserted. Everyone went home. Uh, they had a couple small dormitories, but the vast majority of us lived at home in the surrounding counties or in Terre Haute area. So uh, uh, the faculty we had, we had no teaching assistants. and. Uh, Faculty was really excellent, um, as what you can imagine. Yes, as you can imagine, I struggled a bit that first year because I still had not been that real student, and uh, wasn't sure I was going to make it. But uh, I was luck would have it. Uh, friends of mine from my high school set up a double date with uh, this young lady that I had uh, met through some friends, and uh, yeah. we we dated started going steady soon. I secretly asked her to marry me on January 1st of our freshman year. Her dad only had like a year or two of high school, but was determined, was very, one of the most pro education people I've ever met. He was determined she get a college education. So we knew that if we told the parents we're engaged, they'd have a heart attack. So we, that was a secret for two years before I gave her a ring, but, uh, that's nice. When she, she was going to Indiana State as well? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So you were in the same class? Uh, yes. She eventually started out in, uh, like, uh, medical technology, but switched to elementary mm. ed. So uh, I think we only had one class, history class, together. But, yes, we were there. So, And she gave me, frankly, a lot of the confidence that uh, changed my life around academically. Good. And that made uh, life good. Uh, it was an interesting time because it was right at the end, it was in 1954, and the Korean War just ended. So my classes were full of veterans from come, the Korean then War. Come back, uh -huh. oh, yeah, probably a third to more. And a lot of my classes were populated by what we would call now non-traditional students. And uh, I hardly knew anyone in college who had a college graduate in their families. 
we are almost all of us the very first person to go to college in their family. That's wonderful. And that was... That's a nice flavor. It's a nice thing to look to have, yeah. be able to experience, you know. You may appreciate it even more. Oh, yes. Right. So I, the first year, we we didn't get into broadcasting classes. I was just, we were on a term system. I was taking normal, you know, just general classes. And then started uh, trying to decide what I wanted to do. And pretty much by the end of the freshman year, I decided I wanted to be a teacher. And I wanted to, and so I was a uh, dual major of social studies and speech, and uh, like speech classes. Those came from the seminary, the monastery. We had speech classes, and that's uh, that's where that came from. Okay. You know, you have, and, to have some foundation uh, has to come oh, from yes, somewhere. That uh, gave me the interest. Uh, then, as a sophomore, um, I really started turning. All of a sudden, it was like these grades aren't satisfactory. And I matured. It was just like flipping a switch. Um, I didn't get below a B after that. My first year was 11 C's and a D. So I did not have the most stellar freshman year. Um, that changed drastically. And I had a professor that I uh, was in his speech class, and he was the debate coach. And he started talking to me about joining the intercollegiate debate team. And I told him I couldn't because I was working at A&P and I worked on the weekends and could not be gone and needed the money for the going to school. And so he said, well, I'll tell you what, come into my intercollegiate debate class. And the idea was these would be students to go out to campuses. And he said, you don't have to go on the debates. So I said, fine. And we started the class in the January and I was paired up with a fellow and we were uh, doing debating the topic that was a national topic and we came to the first debate tournament that was going to be at Eastern Illinois and he said we got a problem uh, your partner wants to go to the tournament but we don't have anyone to go with him so do you think the manager of the supermarket would let you go this one time so I talked to the manager he said yes and I was hooked and um, the manager at the a and supermarket was essentially uh, our scholarship. We worked for it, but uh, that fall, I had to back up just a bit, uh, if you remember, the draft was in full force in 1954. And they were moving an Air National Guard base from Indianapolis to Terre Haute. It was going from the old F-51 Mustangs of World War II to the F-80, which was full jet and needed longer runways, and Stout Field in Indianapolis, uh, which is now the National Guard State Police, the runways were too short. And Weir Cook did not want fighter planes fully armed on their commercial runways. So Terre Haute made a bid and Holman Field got it and they brought the Air National Guard base. And a good friend, Fred Johnson, who basically talked me into college, the two of us went down and joined up. Uh, we both liked the Air Force, and uh, this one would, we would also, one week in a month, would help us finance both of us working our way through school. And this would keep us out of the draft. And, uh, the National Guard. Yes, the Air National Guard. And, and I loved airplanes anyway, so that worked out well. So, uh, the, but the manager also, and those of us who decided we wanted to join the reserves, worked our schedule around. So. The weekends that I would have reserve, he would let me come in at 6 in the morning to unload trucks and that so that I would have most of my hours in by noon when I had to leave to go to the air base for the meetings. So Elmer Bennett, the manager, uh, he said yes, that we work around the intercollegiate debate. And yes, you can join the reserves. And uh, he put a lot of us through college, including my brother-in-law later. So. That's wonderful. Anyway, um, I decided then got on the debate team, and that, of course, got me. That was the only activity that gave me a major activity as we represented. Oh, sure. We went to New York City in places where I had never been, hardly been out of the state. And, uh, <laughs> and then was preparing myself to be a high school debate coach is what I decided I wanted to be. That didn't happen either. So another story, you, you know, at my age now, and I'm sure you, most people the same way, when you look back, there are people standing there. If it, if it were not for people that took an interest um, 
your life wouldn't be anything like it was. So that's uh, a very that's a very good comment, and I uh, jump in by saying that many people have shared similar things. Mm -hmm. People remember a teacher in high school, particularly, who really had a big impact and and gave them direction and helped them, and some took them down to Purdue mm -hmm. and things. So it, it, it's re really nice. It was. Uh, I was. I can still remember the day very percent. clearly. I was a junior, late spring, and the Johnsons came through on the Friday afternoon. Uh, that was the only day of the week that the store stayed open late, but I'd be running a check stand. And uh, the Johnsons always came through. I'd got, he was a professor of chemistry, and I'd never had in class, but he had chaperoned a number of dances, and his daughter was uh, in my wife's sorority. And so we knew them very well. And every Friday they would always come through wherever I was checking people out. And I remember uh, asking, uh, say, does Ann have a teaching job? Because we were, in Indiana, all of us were teachers at Indiana State Teachers College. And uh, said, no, she's going to Wisconsin in science, and she has a teaching assistantship. I had no idea what a teaching assistantship was. And uh, they said, you know, you ought to consider grad school and getting an assistantship. So I thought, okay. Uh, but. I had, up to this point, never an intention of going to graduate school, just what teachers were required to do. And I talked to my debate coach and uh, about the possibility, and he suggested some uh, possibilities for graduate school. And uh, so that summer I started looking into some of those and thinking about grad school. And uh, that fall applied, and uh, still then I thought, I'll be a college debate coach. <laughs> That's, I was just moving if I could get admitted to grad school. And spring came along and I'd not heard, and I ended up doing one of the silliest things in my life. I had decided and sent, completed all papers only to the University of Illinois. Little did I know that their program in rhetoric, which is where I would be going and debate and public speaking, was probably the best in the country. I had no idea. I just thought it was, I knew Illinois was a great school, sure, but right. not what I was getting into. And we were planning on getting married, and my wife couldn't apply for a teaching job until it was decided what I was going to do. And I was sitting in the debate coaches, another person standing there in his office one day, saying, you know, it's getting late, it's late March, um, I haven't heard from Illinois. So he said, you know, I got my master's there. Why don't I call? Would you like to go over for an interview? So I said, sure. So he called, set up an interview, and I went over, and then discovered that they rarely admitted a master's student. It was almost all PhD, and almost never an assistantship for a master's student. But that year, they were thinking of getting, bringing in more younger students. Typically the grad student was 30, 35 years old at that time. Oh, they taught for years and worked and got a master's a little bit at a time and then did a PhD. Um, four days after the interview, I got a letter um, in the mail offering me an assistantship. And that, of course, turned everything around. So we went off to Illinois and- uh, Did you get married before you went there? We got married that summer mm -hmm. and went off. They, uh, we rented this big, a basement apartment, a big three-story house in Urbana, and um, the Greek couple thought it was so strange because we moved with all of our wedding gift boxes. So we had the car, so they never seen anyone move in such small boxes because we had, you know, everything, a coffee pot and <laughs> cups and glasses and these, and we just loaded up the car with all these you little boxes. You were lucky. That's so. an easy way to do it. <laughs> yes, it was. Keep it in the box until we get there. Yeah. So I started in Illinois, and... Um, was still thinking, thinking about leaving after the master's, and then uh, the head of the department talked me into staying on for a PhD. What was the campus like in those days? Not as big Oh, as it was, it Illinois when I started 50s, was about 19,000, okay. which was very about, big, very big. Uh, so you're in the, the 60s, it was in 59. Yes, it was 58 60s. when yeah. I went over for the interview when I started. And it was about 18, 19,000 students. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's probably 45, 50,000 sure, students. Right. And, uh, so I stayed on for the PhD, and then we decided that uh, we wanted to start a family. And that after I finished my prelims and was ready to start doctoral research, I would get an instructorship and uh, then do my research in absentia. Didn't quite understand what that was all about either, but anyway, we thought that would be a great idea. So uh, right on schedule, the family started to come along. 
and uh, we rented an apartment in Champaign-Urbana and uh, everything and we'd had that all set up anyway no back up a bit on this anyway we we'd gone to uh, Urbana uh, my wife got pregnant right on schedule at the end of the, of the second year we were there third year we were there um, I got applied for a number of instructorships and one of them was at Purdue which was only 90 miles away so it would be very easy to get back and forth to the library and meet with my committee and so on so um, everything looked wonderful and uh, I was at reserve training camp in uh, Mojave Desert in California in July and uh, I uh, came off the flight line one night and called my wife and she said uh, did you hear Kennedy's speech and I said, no, I was on the flight line till late. We were getting gunnery, guns ready, and, and I was a weapons specialist getting ammunition and planes loaded for uh, gunnery the next morning. She said, uh, we gave a speech on the Berlin crisis, and he mentioned Air National Guard's weapons. And I said, oh, our planes are so old, they're not going to want us in there. And uh, we flew home, and I was waiting at the base for my wife to come get me. And uh, she was eight months pregnant at this point. And uh, some pilots were standing there. And one said, you know, I just got this farm started and now we're gonna be activated. We hadn't activated the reserve since the Korean War. And I thought, what? You know, what's, uh, well, it was that summer, the year before the Cuban Missile Crisis, we came just as close. Uh, uh, Khrushchev was gonna turn over uh, all control to the East Germans, all access routes. And that became Kennedy's first big crisis. So on, we moved to Lafayette, little house down near Central Catholic, drove home on the 29th of August, my wife's birthday, and my father-in-law met us at the door. I had, he lived near the base, so I stored all my stuff there. And he said, have you heard? October 1, you're activated. Our world just... I hadn't even checked in. I hadn't signed a contract here yet and hadn't met. We'd only been in town like four days. You know, it was just like, you know, where do we go now? Came back in town that Monday, met with the head of the department and said, I need a military leave of absence. And he met the person I'd interviewed with other people. So my first request was, I need a military leave of absence. So I taught for two weeks. And then um, off we went. Uh, I remember driving out on Beck Lane to 231, looking back, wondering, will I ever be back here? We had no idea what was happening. And uh, off we went for 10 months. And son was born during the service. And uh, people now only think of the Cuban Missile Crisis. But the fall of 61, we came every bit as close. Yeah, I forgot. Uh, yeah. We had 165,000 of us were activated. Uh, at this point, I was a nuclear weapons loader, and I had top secret clearance because we uh, could carry nuclear weapons and would download these. I became, of all things, a nuclear weapons instructor for the pilots during that year to teach them the controls in the cockpit and what the bomb was like and how it would go off and how their fuses could be set. And, uh, and we came, oh, so close to Third World War, which... No one remembers, but those of us who did, uh, we'd be on the flight line and a warning siren would go off. That meant St. Louis had been hit. Radiation was drifting northeast over our base in Terre Haute. So we'd go into a detox center. Then we could come back out again for so long, and, and we played these games. And then I'd go home in the evening, and I would try to tell people, you've got to take precautions. You've got to do some of these things. You could put books on top of floor, you know, in basement, because books are very dense. So you could literally cover a floor with books, and that would help keep the radiation. And they said, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Next morning, I'd have my uniform on, and we'd go out and play war, and I realized that bomb I was loading could wipe out Terre Haute in an instant, you know, just, anyway. You really experience. Um, it didn't happen. Thank goodness, we came back on August 20th. We got, uh, I was ushered out on August 20th at 10 in the morning. At 12 o'clock, we were in West Lafayette. <laughs> it didn't take us long. We had to rent a little house, and we were back. And then uh, got a lot of work done on the dissertation that year, strangely. And uh, 
and, and then continue with an instructorship. There were a lot of instructors in those days in departments. Okay. And uh, that spring finished my PhD. And, uh, and we had fully intended, we grew up in the Midwest, went to college in the Midwest, we were going east. And uh, this was a, a mere couple of year start where we get our family started. I get my degree done. 48 years later, I got my, what in the words? Oh, I did. Got my watch, gold watch. Uh, so it was. <laughs> good beginning. There was, yeah, yeah, good beginning that I, I had no on idea that we were going to be yeah. there that long. Okay. Anyway, that's that's a long story. <laughs> a lot of interesting things, and the um, Purdue was then only about fourteen, fifteen, six, maybe sixteen thousand. You came point. in what sixty one then, didn't you? Sixty one staff, yeah. Yeah, and um, and you lived, but you still had that ho uh, the house there in Lafayette near Central Catholic. No, no, no. Oh. We we rented that. So, okay. and fortunately, it was. Um, the fellow was an officer uh, in oh. the ground guard and understood our deployment. So we came back, we rented a little house right across from the high school football field on oh. Meridian. Okay. And then moved out across the parkway and rented a house and then built one right in that, what is Barbary Heights. Sure. And then 34 years ago, built about two or three blocks from there and we're still there. So, yeah. but uh, town was a wonderful place to raise our family. Right. And uh, the university and the department kept getting better and better. And it wasn't very many years where there wasn't any place I wanted to go. There was no place better. Mm, so we didn't leave. We we're here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell us a little about when you first came. You were, on one thing, you were the high school de uh, debaters. They were the mm. conference director for that. So the debate yeah, continued. This on. was a very interesting program. It had been going on for. Oh gosh, must have been going on for 30 some years. And um, we would bring in a hundred or more high schools, over a thousand students for a Friday night and all day Saturday. And it was called the Indiana High School Debaters Conference and Student Legislative Assembly. And the real part was the Student Legislative Assembly. And uh, we would have demonstration debates and some things like that. But uh, primarily, and we would have, we had public speaking and we had small group discussion as competitive events. But the real thing was we had uh, three chambers, two house chambers and a senate chamber. And the students would submit bills ahead of time. But we would have members of the General Assembly come for that weekend. They would chair the houses. We would have local clergy being the chaplain for the houses in the senate. So that Friday night, they would work in committees to work up their bill. And then we'd go back to the Department of Speech in Hevelin, and we would have all these bills to do. And so we'd bring our secretaries in, in those days, and manually type all these bills, and then mimeograph all these bills, oh, because yeah. they I had did. to get to the kids' rooms mostly. We'd take over the whole union club, and uh, they had to have these bills by early in the morning. And then the next morning, we would have the chambers set up, just like, uh, and like I say, members of the General Assembly and uh, Doc Bowen was uh, one of the chairs for a number of years. And, before he uh, became governor. Before he became governor. Sure. And uh, we actually had a line item in the state budget to fund this. And I remember Jack Hatcher, who was then in the treasurer's office at Purdue, and eventually I was an accountant, uh, taught in Cranor for many, many years. Um, he was a next door neighbor, and one night he came over and says, what is this line item in the budget? For the, but the members of the General Assembly made sure there was money in the state budget sure, for this. Sure. When um, Bowen became governor, he invited us each year while he was governor to come to the General Assembly and meet him, the top legislators out of the three chambers. Wonderful. What and, a great experience uh, for the students. Oh, oh, we would meet him in his office, governor's office. Then we'd go down to a joint session of the House and Senate, Super. and uh, students would be. What a great! Oh, that's it wonderful. was great, and it was that I did that for ten years, I guess, and then you know, it was such a big operation that I asked the department head, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. need some relief Let here. Let me ask you: uh, most of it was legislative work, but was there time for some debates as well? Oh well, you actually debated like you were in the. Oh yes. Okay. Oh, this was yes. Bring the, the bills, bills, the bills would come, would be ready came. Friday night. That's how it was worked in. They had be introduced, okay. and then the debates all took place the next okay. day, okay. just like you know. And uh, the members of the General Assembly ran it just like it was okay. a legislative session, where right. people would be recognized and would have so long to speak and debate the bills and amendments and all that. It was a wonderful experience for the kids. 
What happened and, then after you uh, moved on? It went on for a few years, but we, what we were um, running into heavily is that more and more of the speech teachers, which have been a sort of the backbone of all this stuff, sure. the debate coaches, became more and more enamored with the competitive debate scene. And this was interfering with their tournaments and the points they were earning going to state and going to national. So the last several years, um, it became the fact that most teachers bringing students were social studies, history teachers, government teachers, mm -hmm. as the speech people went off doing their tournaments. And um, so finally, the focus at that point, it died. Yeah, yeah we decided uh, the attendance dropped and uh, but it was a wonderful program, Sounds so like unique, yeah, so right. unique in its own. Um, tell us a little about some teaching. You've been really involved with that and won several awards in conjunction mm -hmm. with that, and that's been one of your big bailiwicks, which is great. Um, I start out to be a teacher, and that's still what I'm most proud of. Um, the awards were something very, very special. Yes. But yeah. uh, And we'll talk a little bit about them, but yeah. you've gotten... And that, yeah, one thing that you're very... Um, talk a little about your research, one of which is interviewing. You've mm -hmm. done a lot of work with that, and that's key. That was <laughs> another strange experience. Uh, we think we plan our lives. You look back, <laughs> you didn't plan you your life. You look back and realize, <laughs> yeah, no. no right, the exactly. life helped change you. Uh, when I came back from the service, I was teaching 114 and four classes. Um, until I finished my degree, I asked for 7, 30, 8, 36 days a week. Remember, we taught Saturday classes in those days. So by 9.30, I'd be free to do work on my doctoral research and so on. But in uh, 114 was just speeches. I remember one semester I heard 600 speeches. Uh, 114 was good, but to have nothing. So when I finished my degree and uh, then got promoted to assistant professor, I started looking around for an advanced class I could teach, and uh, one of the fellows came there was, in the field at that time, we were starting to move from speech to communication. But there was a divide still between those of us who had been rhetorically trained, traditional, classically trained, and communication theorists who are much more quantitative, statistically oriented. And the interviewing class was typically managed by people who were of the communication variety. But they needed an instructor. And so the fellow who ran the class came in and said, would you like to teach a couple of sections of interviewing? And I said, sure. All I could do was spell the word. I had not the foggiest notion what interviewing was. So I went to the library, got an armload of books, <laughs> trying to teach myself something about interviewing. And there was no syllabus or anything but the class. It was very laissez fair. So I started creating uh, lectures and materials that would go with the four units we had in the class. Um, and ironically, fell in love with it. I shouldn't have. I should have hated it because it was communication. But what I discovered was if you're in front of an audience, but you say adapt to your audience, okay, you have a hundred people. How do you really adapt to that? But if you're an interviewing, face to face, only one person sitting there, you can adapt completely to that person. You don't have to try to adapt all kinds of ages and all that. So I found that the rhetorical tradition I'd been studying was magnified. You talk about eye contact, you know, here you are sitting side by side, nonverbal. You know, most speakers can't even see what their audience is doing, but you can in an interview. So I fell in love with this interpersonal, very close process. And then when that faculty member moved on to Ohio U a few years later, um, the department head asked me if I'd be willing to take over supervising the class. But he waited until this other person was out of town before he announced I was running it because he didn't want to say a rhetorician is going to run the interviewing class. Um, we had no book in the class. We had just a little project text. And, um, and it was, we would have students go to the reserve room, you know, to read four introductory chapters, and that, that was just chaos. But there was no book in the field. And William C. Brown, a uh, publisher representative, came through my office one day in the late 60s and said, uh, what book do you need? And I said, we need an interviewing book. So he looked at me and said, why don't you do it? And I had no intention of writing a textbook. 
but I, uh, one of the grad students who had worked with me as a TA teaching the class, he knew a lot because the book would deal with uh, employment interviewing and performance review, and some of the communication theory I didn't have, but I could deal with structure and questions and persuasion sure. and a lot of things. So he was at Eastern Illinois, and I said, if Bill Cash will go in with me, we'll do it. So I called him. He said it would do it. So we, at that point, each wrote sort of half the book. Uh, then he, who had been doing a lot of consulting, went into industry. So it became more and more and more uh, my bailiwick. But the book was the first in the field, and it's continued to, you have to dominate. Right. I'm now working. I have a January 10 deadline. It's the 14th edition. So it's, okay. And I can't believe the changes I'm making. Each time I do edition, I think, what am I going to do next? Because if I knew better, I'd do it. But then you, two or three years later, you look at it and you think, I don't like any of that. You know? So it's, uh, but it has it's been, it's used typically by about 225 or 30 colleges around the country. And we now have a Korean language edition, and it's used in a number of uh, other countries. And this, again, changed. I've done a lot of consulting, including with the funeral industry. All of that came from the interviewing book, which I never intended to write in the first place. So that was a... <laughs> It You've was. had a lot of things that just worked out. It about, did. Yeah. Uh, it did, and still does. It's given me, as I retired, uh, I write about five or six hours a day, and that's still, so even though I'm um, not teaching, I still have my hand in the field. That's and, good. And I that enjoy keeps, writing. keeps you, and it's nice because you have a lot to contribute, and you can continue to do yeah. that. That's really nice. It's fun to do yeah. that. So that that became one of my major courses yeah. over the years. The uh, Also, you did some... You, rhetorical criticism and message analysis for research. Uh, like make a comment on that. Yeah, That's basically uh, I've essentially been a communication historian. My doctoral dissertation was a study of how the northern Protestant pulpit reacted to the Lincoln assassination. So I did a lot of work in religious rhetoric for a while. Um, I was one of the first to study most people would study a uh, famous speech. For my dissertation, I studied 365 sermons given throughout the North. So I've done a lot of very large. Uh, so really what uh, it amounts to is you analyze the messages and what's in there and what they're doing. And uh, that led to, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, when all the social movements and protest groups around, mm -hmm. uh, I moved. I had been, I'd done a number of studies of the labor movement I had planned on doing that for my dissertation, and it ended up being basically the study of a uh, northern Protestant pulpit. Uh, so, and I had a number of students interested in that. So, from that point on, almost all my research was dealing with protest rhetoric and social movements. Mm -hmm. And I have a book that a sixth edition just came out this summer uh, with two of my former doctoral students uh, in persuasion and social movements. And so, really, I don't deal much with speeches any longer, but I deal with a wide variety of messages, including a lot of electronic messages. Right. So um, I spent a lot of that time. So uh, basically what I do is I get messages, analyze and find out what's going on, what they're doing, and do a, little, a lot of comparative studies. So instead of looking at one message, let's say for uh, anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, look at a wide variety of messages to see what's going on in that situation. To be able to analyze yes. correctly then, right. Um, any committees, that, uh, did you serve on any university committees? All Ooh. kinds of them. Okay. Well, there's ways <laughs> you can talk yes, about I that. Yes, I think uh, the one that I served on, because I asked, continue to ask for it, was Student Affairs Committee. Okay. It fits with my, uh, I can't imagine having done anything but work with students. Uh, that's... Uh, for researchers, just make a comment what the, uh, yes. for that committee, what what was the nature of that one? So you know, student affairs. student affairs committee. We looked at all aspects and this of, is a uni of a university the university, uh, both uh, college and university. Correct. But university okay. senate for our university student affairs committee. Uh, we looked at a wide variety, any kinds of issues uh, that pertain specifically to students, mm -hmm. and whether it be the grievance process. Uh, we even looked early on with Barb Cook uh, when she was still dean of students. Uh, early looking at the alcohol problem and what we could do to try to counteract some of that as it was really starting to, to grow on campus. Um, and then from that, uh, Bob Ringel asked a number of us to uh, spend a long time looking at 
course instructor evaluation programs around the country. And so we spent almost a year uh, studying, uh, getting all kinds of materials, bringing in some experts on course instructor evaluation. And the end result, that went to the uh, faculty senate, and now we have a mandatory course instructor evaluation, and it came out of that committee. Was it um, not, did they not have it before? It, yeah. You could have it done if you, you know, we had a, a program with um, sort of a cafeteria of questions and that in it, but it was not mandatory. Okay. Um, most faculty didn't do it, and it varied a great deal from department to department. And we wanted a program that could be used across campus, and have, departments would have a say in it, uh, how it was done. But the idea was that every teacher at Purdue would have their course evaluated by students every semester. Right. And that's, and that's uh, been going for a long time. So it's been mandatory. I would guess now it's been maybe 20 years now. Yeah, I think Quite so. Quite a while. Yeah. That's been very good. I and mean, I think it's worked well. Yeah. It's used uh, very heavily in course, uh, not only in course instructor evaluations, but promotion decisions. And I was going to ask you that for the research. It's uh, also used for, as you just said, in the promotion. Yeah. Very much so. You put that in your Vita as well. Yeah. And Purdue has been uh, uh, for a huge research university, uh, and a lot of this was Ringel's doing. Um, the emphasis on good teaching was first the Center for, with the, uh, was uh, not Center, uh, Committee for the Education of Teaching Assistance, CETA, and that was set up by Bob Ringel. That eventually morphed into the Teaching Academy, and through all of that, uh, the Center for Instructional uh, Center for Instructional Excellence ballooned into a major resource on this campus, and I've done a lot of uh, seminars and programs with them, and been very active in the CIE. Um, so we've, you know, the university is not just lip service, but the university has really worked at enhancing uh, teaching on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started, um, and I remember uh, uh, when we had the, the, the big training sessions we have just for classes start system, university-wide for teaching us systems, you just handed a textbook. So there's the class. We had no background at all. And uh, so uh, now with the training and the, you know, all the mentoring and uh, uh, it's, yeah, Purdue has been a lot. A very good effort uh, to provide education for uh, teaching assistants, faculty. Some of the seminars I'd have faculty had taught for 30 years or more right. would be in there to see how they can make a class more effective. Let me ask you something. When you first came here, did they have teaching? Did this faculty have teaching assistants? Did they help or um, not? We had teaching assistants, but they didn't work with faculty. They were they pretty much taught standalone. Now, in some of the sciences of that, it varied for right. liberal arts, because in there they might help with labs and, sure. okay. and uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> but most of them either did standalone or something of that nature. As the um, large lecture classes proliferated, then more and more teaching assistants worked uh, arm in arm with faculty in those classes. For about 25 years, I taught the large lecture, Principles of Persuasion, and I would average about 450 students in there. And I always had three TAs. But I did 10 and announced quizzes, 12 exercises, and four exams. <laughs> and so I needed TAs to help grade a lot of things and, <coughs> and to be there for office hours. That's right. So more and more of the teaching assistants have been involved in and working close with faculty members, sure. more than they did with in the, the old With the courses, with the classes, right. <coughs> well, let's, um, that, you talked about that uh, instructor's manual. That's been one of your publications. Mm -hmm. That's been pretty good. Uh, let's talk about the administration, and we'll start with the, um, the uh, one of the things, the director of graduate studies, and then your, and that, and then talk a little about schedules and space. Okay. okay. <coughs> the, uh, Schedules of space had, in the old days, there were always faculty in the department. And each department had a faculty member who would literally schedule all classes and assign all teaching schedules. 
and you work very closely with what we now call Office of Space Management. And um, the eventually now, more and more administrative assistants of that have taken over that kind of role. Uh, our department, because it uh, serves so many students, um, we would have three to 5,000 students a semester in our classes. 114 alone would have a couple thousand students in it each semester. Um, we offer, like the interviewing class, we would typically offer 13 to 15 individual sections. And we had a number of advanced classes like that. Uh, one of my sons went to Wabash College. Um, and I joked at the time that when I schedule our classes, I scheduled five Wabash colleges each semester, you know, and so it was a matter. We would we'd wow. be given so many rooms, and you had to try to f get all of these classes, and I tried, particularly with the faculty, to give them some prefer a Tuesday, Thursday schedule, some Monday, Wednesday, Friday, some afternoon, some evening, try to schedule them what they wanted where. So it was... Uh, Not um, easy to do. No, no. Major, major task, and... Uh, not long after I took over, I think my funniest story was that a faculty member was a great guy. And, uh, and I, I always gave out a sheet, what do you want? So he'd put down Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I signed him classes. He was in mass media at that point. And he came in and he said, Charlie, this is not the schedule I wanted. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I wanted Tuesday, Thursday. I pulled out the form. I said, Bill, it says Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And he looked at me and he said, I can see where you might be confused. <laughs> Yes, I was sort of confused by that. Oh, a little bit. All right. Yeah, <laughs> but, I hear you. Uh, so that, um, I had never intended to be in administration. I don't know how that happened. I, I came, my very first year after I came out of the Air Force, we then had like six intramural speaking contests on campus. Trophy that went to the winning organization that won all this sort of thing. So the department head said, uh, would you run these class, or they'll run these uh, speech contest. So I said, sure. So we, a lot of the bookstores uh, were uh, sponsors for them and so on. Did that, unfortunately, well, I guess. And so the next year, that's when he asked me to take over the high school debaters conference. Okay, I hear you. And that was a big operation. And, um, and so he called me and he said, I want you to do this. But he said, I don't want the high school teachers in that coming to see this really young person running it. So you will run it, but the weekend of the conference, we're gonna have a senior faculty member be on stage welcoming and will be listed as director. Well, the fellow who did it, we have ended up editing a couple of books together, was horribly embarrassed, like, you know, to be called the director when he, so that was, uh, but then I did that well. and. And I guess I did have this kind of administrative flair, which I certainly didn't think I had, but, and then- It was there, right? That went from, as soon as I got asked to be relieved of that, then I was asked to take over schedule in space. And it came at a perfect time. I had two sons heading toward college. I was on a 10 month salary. Um, and schedule in space was 12 month salary. Uh, so I had summers taken care of. And so I did that for 10 years. And then... Uh, it was all paper, though, pretty much at that time, wasn't it? You, you had to turn the paper with the form in and whatever. Yes, you know, all, yeah. all that sort of stuff, yeah. Right. And then um, the, uh, I had commented to the then department head that, that I thought the best job in the department was director of graduate studies. And if it would be open, I would love to move into that. And we had a staff member who had a personal problem. And so I get a call one night saying, are you ready? And it just, but I loved, I loved working with grad students. So you see my Vita, I've directed lots and lots and lots of grad students at both masters and PhDs. I have lots of close friends and co-authors. But you didn't do those at the same time? The schedules and space was at separate? At one point. Oh, uh oh, okay. They did overlap. At one point for a short time, I was director of graduate studies, acting department head, and schedule space deputy. <laughs> that was a short time. So, but then the one left, and uh, but the department head went off on sabbatical. So I was also uh, director of graduate studies and um, acting department head. And then a couple of, uh, years after that, I guess about the end of my second year as director of graduate studies, uh, the department head had been uh, 
it was David Berg, I don't know if you know Mona. I, I yeah. That, yeah. Um, decided he had, after 13 years, he'd had enough. And uh, and what, and I had sworn for years I would never be a department head. I absolutely would never. Don't say that. So I became department head for 10 years. Yeah. And then was out of it for about two and a half years. And Cynthia Stoll, who had beca- take, well, took my place, decided to go to the University of, uh, uh, what's it? University of California in Santa Barbara in January. And so the dean came. Never... You don't want a dean who's a really good friend. That's not a good combination. So it was Peggy Rowe, and we had been close friends for years. And I did not want to go back. And I was perfectly happy. I wanted to spend the rest of my life as a faculty member. I'd had many, many years of administrative work. and uh, But it made sense, because January, when I could walk right back in. It was scary. It was like dreaming that you weren't department head, but when you woke up, you'd been department head all along, you know. Right. Was, so I ended up being then interim head. So I was acting interim and the real thing, yeah. so. Uh, I think that if it's okay with you, I think mm-hmm. this is where, there's things I, I'd like to talk because you mm-hmm. were the head for about 10 years. So mm-hmm. Stop there if that's okay. Sure. And then um, we'll pick up from there and then. But one thing you, before that, maybe you can answer, mm-hmm. the only busman. In 1985, that was prior to when you were there. Yes, that was a. Was that just a one year? Could you? Talk no, a bit I continued about that? that for a number of years. Oh, okay. um, the um, Bob dean. Ringel was. Uh, he was the dean at that he time. He was dean, and he initiated a lot of things. Uh, I'm not sure there was an official ombudsman in any school at Purdue, any college, and he saw a real need where faculty. Who had a real concern about mistreating something, there was a grievance procedure, but could go to that person and talk about the problem and ask for advice and help and be helped if the person then was going to file a form of grievance. Okay. Be so helped this would be prior so not an advocate, but someone could could be there to listen, to give advice. Sure. Just to say those aren't grounds for appeal. You know, people think they can have grievance over everything, but they're very specific what you can file a grievance on, and right. you can't do it with some of those. So, um, There wasn't so, one before that? No. Oh, okay. So I agreed to do that, and then eventually uh, Ralph Webb came on also, as well, we decided we really needed. Um, he took, I guess he took over my place. How long and, did you do that for? A couple of years? Oh um, gosh, I can't remember. It was several years. Okay. Yeah, uh, several did years. Did other schools have them too? They, I think they do now. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I think that was going to come, but I think we were the first. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I was trying to think whether it was faculty affairs committee, but there was a committee set up to look into the ombudsman to review the whole ombudsman thing, and I was on that committee, and uh, we decided a big change we made. Things were working well. But we decided there ought to be two, and one should be female. That uh, a woman mm-hmm. might not feel comfortable coming to a man if she had a mm-hmm. problem with a male faculty member. So that was the big change, I think, that we uh, started with two ombudsmen and uh, one for, uh, uh, now, female could go to her, and male could, male could go to a female, but the option was there. Sure. If you felt more comfortable with, or maybe you like, you knew one person and better just than another one. Right. felt better with that person. But you had the op- you had both. You could do it. Yes. Way. Right. So I, I don't know how many years I served the ombudsman for a number of years, mm-hmm. and uh, then and it was. Is it still going? It was healthy. Yes. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I forgot about that, but something mm-hmm. when I was doing my research, I came across it, and I thought, well, I'll ask you about yeah. that. Then. Okay. All right. We'll stop okay. that. Um,